Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at photorespiration and CAM photosynthesis. Now this isn't needed for all examples, so make sure that you actually do need to know this before you watch the whole video. But there is lots of fascinating science going on in here, which you need to pay careful attention to the detail of. So we're going to have a quick look at photorespiration and some alternative types of photosynthesis that plants have adapted to overcome this. If you need this for your spec, this will be very useful. If not, it's a good bit of extra information and beyond the spec reading that you can use as well. Normal photosynthesis is actually a bit inefficient. It's not super efficient in most plants. And this is because of rubisco. Rubisco is actually the most important because without it, we wouldn't have oxygen in the atmosphere. And it's also the most abundant enzyme on Earth because it's in every chloroplast, in every cell of every plant and everything that photosynthesizes. So all photosynthetic algae and also some photosynthetic bacteria, cyanobacteria, they all have rubisco. It's incredibly important and incredibly abundant on the planet, but it's actually evolved to work in a very high concentration of carbon dioxide. So when plants first evolved, the atmosphere was very different to what it is now. It was high in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and actually quite low in oxygen. And the reason that shift changed to it being a high oxygen environment and low carbon dioxide environment is because of the evolution of plants, land plants, and them carrying out photosynthesis, partly increased the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, which allowed animal life to exist. So in our current atmosphere, where we actually have a high oxygen atmosphere and low carbon dioxide as a ratio, rubisco can actually combine with oxygen when CO2 is in low concentrations and in other situations, which we'll talk about in a minute. So it can actually bind to oxygen as well as carbon dioxide. So we've got our Calvin cycle here, just as a reminder. So normally we'd have carbon dioxide combining with our UBP to make our first molecules. And that would happen through catalyzing, catalyzation with rubisco. So when O2, so oxygen, binds to our UBP instead of carbon dioxide, it just makes one 3PGA molecule instead of two. And it makes another two carbon compound. So this two carbon compound can't carry on in the Calvin cycle like the PGA molecule can. So it needs to be converted back to that in order to be able to carry on a Calvin cycle. And in order to do that, we need to use ATP and some amino acids. Amino acids would have been made using the products of the Calvin cycle. So using some TP or GALP, we would have converted those into amino acids with adding some nitrogen. So we've used up some energy and some products of a Calvin cycle to do this, and it also releases carbon dioxide. But it allows that 3PGA to then go back into the uh, Calvin cycle. Because the whole process uses oxygen at the start instead of carbon dioxide, and it produces carbon dioxide through the conversion of that two carbon compound, it's known as photorespiration because we're using oxygen, producing carbon dioxide, so we call it photorespiration. So photorespiration actually wastes about 25% of the products of photosynthesis. So all of those that carbon that, and the sugars that we get out, that then we can use the TP that we can use to then make all of our other biological molecules, we're actually wasting that by using 25% of it to actually regenerate that two carbon compound and use the, what happens from photorespiration. And so it seems completely wasteful, but actually it is thought to be a bit useful and does help to protect the plant from oxidative stress. So if there's too much oxygen, oxygen has built up, it can be damaging to the cell. So what they can do is they can use photorespiration to kind of limit that damage by breaking down the oxygen and using it. But when it happens, when there isn't a really, really high concentration of oxygen and it's just that there's a low concentration of carbon dioxide, then it is wasteful. And when, so when does it happen? When do plants do photorespiration? It happens mostly at high temperatures 
and high light intensities. So I've got an example here of somewhere very dry and very drought suffering where there's it's very, very dry in the soil, but it's got high light intensity, high temperatures. And these conditions, plants are going to have to close their stomata because they're going to have to stop water loss from occurring in order to survive. But because they've done that, that prevents them from doing gas exchange. So that reduces the amount of carbon dioxide they can take in and it will cause oxygen to build up in the cells because that will still be being produced from photolysis, but it won't be able to go anywhere, it won't be able to diffuse out of the stomata because they're shut. So in these conditions is when photorespiration is likely to take place. So in order to combat this, desert and tropical plants that live in high light intensity, high temperature environments have had to develop adaptations to prevent photorespiration from occurring all the time and so that they don't waste too much carbon that they're producing from photosynthesis so that they can still grow and survive. In normal plants that don't have these adaptations then photosynthesis is known as C3 or they're known as C3 plants because they fix the carbon dioxide into a three carbon molecule which is GP as we know. So that's where they get their name and that will explain why we call the alternatives C4, which we're going to look at now. So one of the adaptations to being a tropical plant, in this case grasses, and maize is an example of one of these tropical grasses that does this, is they carry out a method of photosynthesis called C4 photosynthesis. So they do this in order to reduce photorespiration and they are able to keep rubisco and RUBP away from oxygen. So they fix their carbon dioxide into a four carbon molecule, hence why we call this C4, and they, they manage to do the fixing separate from the Calvin cycle. So they keep rubisco away from oxygen so it doesn't bind to oxygen instead of carbon dioxide. And they keep the concentration of carbon dioxide really high where the rubisco is. So they actually do it in separate cells. So I've got a cross section of a leaf here quickly. These are our mesophyll cells. These are obviously the spongy mesophyll cells. And if you can imagine in C4 plants, instead of having all these big air gaps around them, they do have air gaps, but they are very, very close to and stick right next to these, this circular bundle of cells in the middle around the vein. So the vascular bundle or the vein is in the center, that's where the xylem and the phloem are. And then around that vascular bundle, we have the bundle sheath cells, which surround it. And then we've got our mesophyll cells up close and next to the bundle sheath cells. So there's no air contact actually with the bundle sheath cells. They're surrounded by the mesophyll cells, but the mesophyll cells in the spongy mesophyll then have those air gaps and have that contact with the gases. And this is how we can start separating it. So the fixing of carbon dioxide happens in the mesophyll cells which have contact with the gases that are diffusing around the spongy mesophyll and they are then surrounded by uh, surrounding the bundle sheath cells which is where the Calvin cycle will actually take place. The mesophyll cells have an enzyme called PEP carboxylase so it carboxylases or carboxylates PEP so it adds a carbon um, dioxide to PEP that's where we're going with this so it has a very high affinity for carbon dioxide, higher than rubisco, and it doesn't have any affinity for oxygen. So it combines the carbon dioxide and a molecule called PEP, which creates a four carbon compound. And that four carbon compound is then converted into another four carbon compound called malate. Now, the malate is important because that's what then enters the bundle sheath cells. It gets actively transported in. So we do need to use a bit of ATP here. And the carbon dioxide that's attached to that is removed. So it can then enter the Calvin cycle and react with the RUBP using Rubisco and go through the light independent reactions. So the malate is just really a transport for the carbon dioxide to take it into those bundle sheath cells but it just provides a constant supply of carbon dioxide for the, cal um, the Calvin cycle in the bundle sheath cells where the rubisco is. So I've zoomed in to draw like a little diagram of what this looks like. So we've got the carbon dioxide coming in to 
the mesophyll cells. So carbon dioxide is coming into the mesophyll cells. It's being combined with PEP using the PEP carboxylase enzyme, and then that gets converted into the malate. There's no rubisco here, so it wouldn't react with that anyway. It's reacting with the PEP carboxylase and PEP instead. But we fixed the carbon dioxide into this malate. And then the malate is actively transported into the bundle sheath cells. It splits up, so we've got carbon dioxide gets released, it gets um, detached, broken off, and then the three carbon compound that's left goes back into the mesophyll cells and goes around again. And so then the carbon dioxide then enters the Calvin cycle in the bundle sheath cells because it has rubisco and it combines with IUBP and off we go with the light independent reactions. So this separation of space actually means that we create a really high concentration of carbon dioxide in the bundle sheath cells, higher than it would normally be. And there's no oxygen there because the um, bundle sheath cells have no access to the air or the gases. So no photorespiration is happening, which means we're very, being very efficient with our photosynthesis in these plants. So there is another form of C4 photosynthesis, which we are going to call CAM photosynthesis. The long form of that is Crassulacean acid metabolism, and it's a form of C4 photosynthesis. It's named Crassulacean because that's the family of plants in which it was first identified. And we know that mostly this is used by succulents and cacti and desert plants. And they have this adaptation because it allows them to only need to open their stomata at night time. So they do not absorb any carbon dioxide during the day. Their cells fix carbon dioxide at night time using the same method. So using PEP carboxylase, and they convert it into malate, which is also known as malic acid, which is where the acid part comes from in the name of this method of photosynthesis. The malic acid or the malate is then stored in the cells vacuoles overnight. So we know vacuoles are used for storage and then it gets released in the daytime where it can be broken down and provide the carbon dioxide in the same way as, as in the C4 um, for the Calvin cycle. Because obviously we need the products of the light dependent reactions in order to do the Calvin cycle. And if they aren't happening at night time, then we can't do the light independent reactions but we can store the carbon dioxide in the form of the malic acid in the vacuole overnight and then slowly release the malic acid, which will get broken down to release the carbon dioxide. And then that carbon dioxide can just go straight into the Calvin cycle once we have enough ATP and reduced NADP from the light dependent reactions. So why do they have this adaptation? Well, obviously closing stomata in the day prevents water loss because in the daytime in the desert, it's gonna be much hotter, much higher light intensity. So there's gonna be a lot more transpiration taking place. So we lose more water. So if we can open them at nighttime, when it's cooler, much less um, transpiration is gonna take place. So we're going to lose less water. So it literally has allowed them to survive in places where it would literally be life-threatening to open your stomata during the day. You would lose so much water, the plants would die. So this has allowed them to adapt to survive in these environments by closing their stomata throughout the whole of the data. So let's go through a quick summary then of what we just talked about. It's quite short, but it's good to know these adaptations, good to be able to explain them, could use them to explain various data, questions, or just as an example of adaptations of plants. So photorespiration is when rubisco binds oxygen instead of carbon dioxide mostly happens at high temperatures and high light intensities when there's a low concentration of carbon dioxide, often when stomata are shut. It wastes photosynthetic products and it uses up ATP. C4 photosynthesis is done by tropical grasses and it's a separate, they separate the fixing of carbon dioxide and the Calvin cycle into separate cells. And this is to avoid rubisco being in contact with oxygen at any point. So it reduces photorespiration by maintaining high concentrations of carbon dioxide in cells, which carry out the Calvin cycle. Then we have CAM photosynthesis, which is done by cacti and desert plants. 
and they separate fixing carbon dioxide and the carbon cycle into different times. So it allows their stomata to only open at night time and prevent water loss. By fixing the carbon dioxide at night time and storing it as an acid in the vacuoles, and then it releases it during the day for the light independent reactions. So we've got C4 photosynthesis separates the fixing and the Calvin cycle in space, whereas CAM fixes it and does the Calvin cycle at different times. C4 photosynthesis is making photosynthesis more efficient at high temperatures, and so those plants are adapted to live in tropical areas and high temperatures, and it makes better use of photosynthesis and stops them losing product. And CAM photosynthesis allow, has allowed those plants to survive in very dry environments. So they've become able to live in very extreme dry environments that other plants just wouldn't survive in because they can separate when they open their stomata in day and night time. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches. <laughs>